Morning everyone and welcome to Cleveland Clinic and South Westminster BIDS joint webinar on women's health. Um, for those that aren't aware, Cleveland Clinic has a hundred year history globally uh, and we'll be opening our first UK hospital in Victoria in January 2022, as well as our first outpatient building in Harley Street this year. We're fortunate today to have Cleveland Clinic London's Chair of General Practice, Dr. Ruth Whit Whitby and Director of Concierge Medicine, Dr. Helen Mitakidis, um, speaking for us today. I'm just going to take us through the agenda and then hand over to the doctors. So first up, uh, Dr. Ruth Whitby will talk about the importance of women's health screening and how age influences investigation choices. And then Dr. Helen McKidis will take, take us through menopause treatments and common concerns. And then Ruth will be rounding us up with potential causes of non-diet related weight gain in women. And then finally, we'll have about 10, 15 minutes for a Q&A session. There is a little Q&A icon at the top of your screen. So if you do have any questions, please put them in there and we'll run through them at the end. Uh, Dr. Whitby, I'll let you take it away. Uh, I think it might, be, it might be on mute, Dr. Whitby. Hello, that's a great start. And uh, <laughs> the, the um, not, not a very, um, uh, you would think by now I'm well-versed with the COVID risks. But welcome everybody and thank you very much for joining us. Um, I'm going to talk first of all about um, screening, screening in general, um, this first slide is cancer screening, but this message really applies to all sorts of screening. And what screening is picking up illnesses or tr conditions before they become serious and conditions that we can help and do something about. So we need a very reliable test to pick up the cancers, obviously. We need to have tests that don't do more harm than good. We need to have tests that are such that women or people in general are willing to, to, to participate in. And we've got to importantly have a very, very low rate of false positives or false negatives and particularly in overdiagnosing um, and giving people a lifetime of worry for which there actually doesn't turn out to be a very high risk. Um, this, this is a very important feature in, in screening programs. Next slide, please, Christian. So I'm going to talk mainly about two um, of, well, I'll talk about the main screening programs for women, since this is um, a women's health talk, but uh, do feel free at the end to talk more generally about screening. Um, screening is, is influenced, which screenings we do is influenced very much by the age of our patients. And I will show you some slides to show you the, the importance of not doing screenings as a tick box exercise, but actually to try and capture the population in whom screening can be of benefit. So in cervical cancer, we know that this is a cancer that is associated with a younger age and in premenopausal women. So the emphasis is to pick up these patients. And these are the patients, therefore, that are sent the NHS reminders or private GPs will send the reminders. When I move on to breast cancer, breast cancers tend to be more prevalent in people after the menopause. And therefore, their routine screenings are invited after that time. But we will all know of people, and sadly, we are all aware that the cancers don't fit into a neat little box and can unfortunately affect people of all different ages. This is the most common presentation. However, there are factors which I will go into, which would push you into an earlier or a later or a more sustained screening program for a particular cancer if you're in that risk group. So you'll see the reassuring headline of this slide cervical cancer, the lifetime risk is actually less than 1%. And this risk reassuringly continues to fall because we've got better screening and we understand the disease more. We now recognize that the risk of cancer, cervical cancer is very, very intimately associated with the presence of a virus called HPV. 
there are many HPV viruses. And as you will see on this slide, two in particular, HPV 16 and 18, will contribute towards having HPV picked up on a smear does not mean you have cancer. It does not mean you're going to develop cancer. It just means you are at a slightly higher risk. And therefore, we would send you for um, an advanced type of screening called colposcopy, where we would try and remove those cells that we know are positive for HPV. But HPV is so common in the community. And most of HPV virus has a, a, a sort of life, if you like, of two years. So it naturally will clear up even in those people who are positive after two years without doing any damage. I mentioned that, that our lifetime incidence of cervical cancer is now less than 1%. Two of the big factors in that is an awareness for screening nowadays. Um, and there have been some high profile cases of, of celebrities, for instance, promoting the values of screening that saved or tragically in the case of Jay Goody didn't save her life. But we are now as a, as a, as a nation and indeed in many countries, much more aware of the importance of this simple procedure. But in cervical cancer, the other factor that has really contributed to the decline in the prevalence of, of picking up cancers is the um, development of a vaccine for um, cervical cancer against the four main cancers that are associated with HPV and cervical cancer. Um, and many of you will have had or have heard of this vaccine, it's called Gardasil. And ideally we like to administer it as a, it's a two part vaccine. We like to do that at a, before a woman is sexually active. This vaccine has been licensed to be given to girls of the age of nine, which of course in some countries tragically can um, be this onset of sexual activity. In the UK and in fact uh, in the US as well, the um, license has been granted from the age of 12 when we feel that these girls are old enough to understand why they're being given this vaccine. This vaccine has dramatically reduced cancer prevalence. And in fact, the usual NHS recall of three years, if you've had an HPV vaccine can be extended to five, if not more. But it's imperative that we continue to screen. And you'll see in the bottom right-hand corner, there are other factors we don't understand what they are or what they all are or how they work but we know that the earlier the age of your first ever sexual intercourse has a high positive correlation with the risk of developing cancer so it could be that the the cells the immature cells are more vulnerable smoking has a strong positive correlation and people who are immunocompromised that means people who perhaps are, are on chemotherapy or immunosuppressant therapy or have been very ill, it's, it's even more important that these women are screened because the body's natural defences against HPV are reduced and we see a higher incidence of cervical cancer in these patients. So um, that's really the importance of cervical cancer. I do want to just touch on, which is very topical, and since we are in a London audience, that uh, many of you will have seen or even started to receive in the post um, cervical self-testing kits and uh, this is very exciting and goes in line a lot with the need for much more virtual medicine because of the the pandemic um, what these swabs are doing is that you insert the swab much as you would do say a tampon but you insert the swab and you pop it back into a little plastic vial and send it back again and these re are looking for the HPV virus. So again, it's just picking up people who are going to be at risk, but it's uh, we don't know yet what, what the outcome of this trial will be. It's literally just being rolled out now, but it could well be an important 
factor in almost eliminating if it gets screening to people who would otherwise not attend. Next slide, please. This is, I'll just quickly show you, this is a, a neat slide by the Council Research UK, which just shows the incidence is so age related. And that's why we, we do our screening program designed on the, on the relative values of actually picking up um, the, an incidence. Um, it is, as we know, a cancer that is driven by having hormones. So clearly as we get older and we become postmenopausal, the risk really drops off. Um, next slide, please. So I now just want to touch on breast cancer screening. Um, the lifetime risk in the UK is between eight and 15%. So I think this slide actually is, is a, a little pessimistic. It's a, a little lower than that. Um, and this is a, a cancer that most of us will know we, is a very simple, if not unpleasant screening, but is so important um, to, to um, treat and to pick up before there has been a development we can pick up absolutely micro tiny um, cancers with no seeding, no sp spread, and pick these up before they really develop and therefore manage the treatment of the risk, the cancer risk, so much more easily. 96 out of 100 women who go for a mammography have a normal result. So four will need a little further testing. And of that four, one will have cancer. So this, we, what I wanted to do was perhaps dispel some myths and, and just touch on what are the main risk factors for cancer of the breast. And actually the main risk factor is your age and women, between the four, age of 47 and 70 are the ones who are traditionally called for breast screening because you will see on the in a slide a couple of slides time that there is such a steep curve which correlates with the instance both of picking up and of finding cancers with age. The other big factor which I'll talk about in my second little talk is obesity. Obesity has such an impact and risk to developing breast cancer. And actually age and obesity are the main contributors to breast cancer. We know that having had one cancer, you are at risk of another cancer. We know that having breast cancer in the family will increase your risk. But it, in the next slide, I'll show you, it's surprisingly low risk. Having dense breast tissue can increase your risk of cancer. This could be because it is harder to actually interpret the mammogram and many people with dense breast tissue will be called back for an ultrasound, not because anything's been found in their breast, but because it's been hard to interpret the pattern in breast dense breast tissue. And this reduces any risk of not seeing the cancer. My uh, colleague, Helen, is going to talk about um, the impact of very, interesting subject that everybody asks about the impact of HRT on uh, the development of breast cancer, which will, may or may not surprise you, is very low. Alcohol, unfortunately, does increase breast cancer risk. And interestingly, late childbirth um, increases the risk. So if I just briefly go on to my next slide, please. Um, many of you have heard now of what we're calling the Angelina effect, and this has been to just really publicise um, in a very self-depreciating way the, what, the importance of breast screening and why she um, was at risk. And that's because she had a gene called BRCA, many of you have heard of, that is a high risk for potentially developing breast cancer. So if you had this risk factor, we would do a, a, a quite an intense screening on you. But if you 
look to get it into context, only about 15% of cancers that we find in women have a family history of, of, of having had breast cancer. And of that 15%, Roughly five to ten percent will have a BRCA gene, so it's a a small, small part of the um, of the cancers. Actually, I should say to you, of the ones that are hereditary, um, they have a small incidence of having BRCA. Sorry. Next slide, please. And to end, I will on these two screenings. I'll you can see here how the um, incidence really increases with age um, and the peak being around 69. The, um, the incidence found before the ages of 30 is, is minimal and putting women through the risks of a mammogram and that is the radiation certainly doesn't provide enough benefit um, when we look at risk benefit to a patient, unless there was some other circumstance, you know, we found a lump or they had a very strong risk factor. Next slide, please. To cover, and we can, we can discuss some of these more in our question and answer, there are many other female cancers that we now can help reduce um, the development of, but we don't have simple, reliable tools for the ones that are specific to women. That's the uterine one, the uterus and the ovary. You can see that the lifetime risk of, the, of developing these as female cancers is small. And we already recognize from this, some of the, the um, risk factors, which will cross over a lot with um, the the breast cancer and or cervical cancer that I've mentioned. Certainly with the uterus, much like the breast, age and obesity, the big ones. Ironically, the treatment for breast cancer can make this um, cancer slightly more common, prevalent, that's tamoxifen and HRT, particularly inappropriate use of HRT, which Helen will talk about. Ovarian cancer is a horrible cancer because it can remain quiet for so long and be really aggressive in its presentation when found. We are working hard to try and improve our screening. There is still no reliable screening test. Um, we can now measure blood markers that indicate a risk, but it is really a picture at that moment because if you're the blood count, and this is really one of the messages of screening. If your risk factor for picking up a ovarian cancer in the blood is high, just the next day it could be back to normal. So this is very much looking at that moment. We are now doing pelvic ultrasounds with much more accuracy for both uterine and ovarian cancer, but again, they're not predictive, which is what's so important about a screening. We're trying to predict the risk so that women never develop um, a full-blown cancer. Bowel cancer, I've just tagged on at the end of this slide, um, lifetime risk of 6%. It's obviously not specific to women, and in fact, more common in men, but um, we are doing greater screening now for, uh, for reassuring me of picking up early cancers. And I would implore any of you who get an invitation in the post to go for a, a colonoscopy or get a stool kit in the post just to follow that through because we can eliminate bowel cancer by uh, that screening tool. I'm happy to answer questions at the end of the the, the, this webinar, um, but it brings me great pleasure now to hand over to my colleague, Helen, who's going to talk about the menopause. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ruth, and thank you everybody for this opportunity. Um, I'd like to speak about the menopause, which is also known as the change, which is an inevitable process that every single woman will go through. And what is the menopause exactly? Well, as the word menopause, meaning the pause or stoppage of our periods or men or menstrual. And that is actually signifies a point in time of one year without our periods. Now, the average age that happens in women in the UK is around 51, but it can happen younger. In fact, 1% of women 
have the menopause under the age of 40 and about 0.1% under the age of 30. So the transitional period that leads to the menopause um, is a time where there's a lot of fluctuating ovarian function, and that's called the perimenopause, peri in the medical terminology, meaning around the time. And often what that um, reflects is these fluctuating levels of predominantly estrogen, which are produced by the ovary. So women have menopausal symptoms, but can still have their periods. And those periods can be normal, or they can be lighter, or even heavier, um, or the cycle length can be increased or decreased. So um, next slide, please, um, Christian. What are the menopausal symptoms? Well, the menopausal symptoms are as a result of low levels of estrogen. And we have estrogen receptors throughout our body. We have it in our brain, we have it in our heart, we have it in our skin, and our muscular, musculoskeletal system, like our joints. So women respond to this lack of estrogen in such a varied way. And the, that response can be, their symptoms can be very mild or they can be very significant and impact their lives. And we all very, very different and we all respond differently. So early on in the perimenopause, it's quite common, about 80% of women will experience hot flushes and night sweats. But there can be other symptoms of mood swings, of musculoskeletal aches and pains, of um, this brain fog, uh, difficulty in concentrating, memory lapses, weight gain, palpitations. Uh, women can also suffer from sleep disturbances and low libido. So every woman is very different and we all um, have a variable um, experience. So next slide, please. How do we diagnose menopause? Well, over the age of 45, we take a history and we ask about the woman's periods and if she has any menopausal symptoms, as I alluded to earlier on. But there's actually no need to do a blood hormonal level. And the reason for that is during that time, the hormones are fluctuating so much, they're literally yo-yoing up and down. So when we take blood, all we're doing is we're actually measuring what that hormone level is at the second of that blood test. So it doesn't really correlate with the symptoms that women are experiencing or whether they need treatment. Now, in younger women, we definitely would like to do blood tests because we want to check if they are going through the menopause and more importantly also to exclude correctable causes. And what I mean by that are causes like an underactive thyroid. Um, so it's also important to do bloods in that age group. Um, next slide, please, um, Christian. So it makes sense that our symptoms are as a result of lack of estrogen or low levels of estrogen. So the most effective medical management by far is replacing those hormones. So estrogen predominantly and progesterone in some women. And that's called HRT or hormone replacement therapy. And HRT not only alleviates the symptoms that we were mentioning, the hot flushes, the poor sleep, the vaginal dryness, etc., but it also confers long-term protection for our bone health and our heart health. And these um, uh, HRT comes in so many different types and forms. It can come as a combination with progesterone for some women, or it can come alone, estrogen alone for, for others. It can come in a tablet form. It can be delivered through the skin as a patch or gel. And in some women that have local vaginal symptoms or local bladder symptoms, it can also come as a vaginal um, ring or a vaginal tablet or cream. So they're very various types, a lot of combinations, a lot of different dosages. And it isn't one type fits all. We're all very different and we all need this individualized approach on what is the, where we are in our menopause or, or perimenopause, what are our symptoms, what are our risk factors, um, and then we need to make that informed decision once we have the information. So I just want to touch a little bit of on body identical hormone replacement therapy. So body identical hormone replacement therapy is natural estrogen and progesterone um, that comes from plants, um, for example, yams. And it's got the same chemical structure as our own physiological estrogen and progesterone. 
So the safety is much better than synthetic estrogen and progesterone, and they have fewer risks. Next slide, please. So like any medication, there's always benefits and there's risks. So overall, I can reassure you that HRT confers more benefits than risks. But obviously there will be risks and one of the most well-publicized risks of HRT is breast cancer. And there is heightened anxiety about breast cancer because it is a common condition and women are scared to take HRT because of that risk and doctors sometimes are scared to prescribe it because of that risk. But it's important to put that risk in context. So this is a very interesting infogram from the um, Cancer Research UK, where it looks at a thousand women aged between 50 and 59. And it looks at the risks of what is the likelihood of women having breast cancer in the next five years in the UK. So unfortunately, breast cancer is a common condition. So there are 23 cases of breast cancer diagnosed out of those thousand women um, over five years. And as you can see, if women are on the combined hormone replacement therapy, which is estrogen with progesterone, and the reason we give progesterone with estrogen is for women that have a uterus. As Ruth mentioned earlier on, um, it's important if you have a uterus because estrogen kind of builds up the endometrium or the inner lining um, of the uterus, it's important to have the progesterone to protect the lining from endometrial um, cancer. So if women are on this combined hormone replacement therapy, that risk is increased by four cases or 0.4% added risk. Now, if we compare that with women that drink two or more units of alcohol a day, that risk is actually five cases, additional five cases or 0.5% added risk. And as again, Ruth alluded to her, um, to her uh, previous talk, Women that are overweight or obese with a BMI of equal or greater than 30 have an increase of 2.4% added risk or an extra 24 cases. So also another thing to point out is women that exercise regularly. So if they have two and a half hours of moderate exercise per week, that risk drastically reduces, as you can see, and there's seven fewer cases in a thousand women. So it's all about looking that in that in, into perspective. Um, next slide, please. So some women prefer not to take HRT, and that's fine. And in some women, it's contraindicated. So what is available? Well, there's a lot of alternative therapies available. And there are non-hormonal prescribed treatments that we use for symptom alleviation, like antidepressants for hot flashes and mood swings. And there's clonidine as well, which is a drug that's prescribed for hot flushes. And of course, there's also herbal and natural remedies um, that interest women a lot. And it is a bit of a minefield, and it's important to have that kind of information before women make choices about which option they should take. Uh, herbal therapies are not really well studied in terms of their long-term effects or their long-term outcome. They do work in a lot of women, and they do give symptom relief, especially in the short term, but the long-term protection is not, um, hasn't been studied. And some of these herbal medications, unfortunately, are also not regulated by the MHRA. So the safety, um, the safety and purity, um, there could be safety and purity issues with them. There are some other herbal medications that work really well in the short term, but can also cause side effects and also interact with medication that women might be on. And a very well-known example of that is um, St. John's wort, which is really good in helping women with hot flushes and mood swings. However, they can cause um, significant side effects in some women and can interact with medication that women are on, for example, warfarin and tamoxifen. So finally, I just want to conclude with probably one of the most important things to empower women about, and that's to make them think about their lifestyle. And this is especially important during the stage of the perimenopause and menopause, to maintain um, a healthy body weight, to exercise regularly, to stop smoking, um, to eat a sensible diet, 
to reduce alcohol um, intake and the, all things that we all know about. But these are so important in helping us women to go through perimenopause and menopause. And more importantly, to reduce our risks of developing anything future like cardiovascular risk, to reduce our risk of osteoporosis, and of course, as we said earlier on, to reduce our risk of breast cancer. Thank you very much, Ruth, and thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Helen. And actually, um, we are running over time a little, so I'll keep this last discussion brief. Um, but Helen has touched on quite a few of the points, so it leads very nicely into talking about obesity, which is um, a very common presentation to the general practice. Now, I said I'd keep this um, discussion brief that's not to say I don't think and we all know that weight as you've seen in the two talks already is a very very highly important topic it's one that's often dismissed but its significance is crucial to our physical health and our mental well-being and weight gain in midlife it not only uh, contributes to the cancers, which we've concentrated on today, but there are so many other conditions that it worsens as we get older, particularly arthritis, mood swings, heart disease, diabetes, the risk of stroke. And interestingly, we are now seeing that weight gain is often associated with more frequent and more severe menopausal symptoms. Now, on average, women will gain half to 0.7 kilograms every year from midlife, from 50 to 60, independent of race or ethnicity. And unless this is addressed, either correcting, which I'll talk about underlying causes or modifications of the our lifestyle, then becoming obese or overweight is an inevitable progression. The definition of being obese versus overweight is based purely on what's called our body mass index. And it is used medically particularly as a useful tool for predict predicting um, the problems in health that people concern. So a body mass index over 25, the ideal being between 20 and 25, is known as overweight. After 25, th sorry, after 30, if I got that right, so 20 to 25 is normal, 25 to 30 is overweight, and over 30 is known as obese. Now, GPs, and I feel very strongly about this, have a really essential role in not just recognizing and addressing weight loss, but supporting weight loss and presenting and preventing that list and more of the health issues that is associated with this inevitable tendency. Each of us requires a balance and ultimately our weight is a product of what we put in and what we burn out or burn up. Now, many of us can be very efficient at burning fuels and can eat and never put on weight. Others are much less fortunate and require only a fraction of the calories compared to their friend, for instance, to maintain a steady weight. Very often, I am, a, I am asked by my patients, I eat almost nothing and I am not, and I'm putting on weight or I'm unable to lose weight. And this is real. And there is no doubt that if we go through the calorie intake of that person, it may be very small, as I've mentioned, though inefficient burning up of energy. But there also can be mistakes or eating foods that you think are healthy, but in fact are laden with high energy calories, which will not be helping control your weight. But there are other factors that need to be excluded before we just prescribe, if you like, lifestyle changes. Now, it wouldn't be appropriate just here to go into detail, but I'll just mention six um, areas that I think are very important that you could ask your GP about if you're in this bracket. 
The first one is to check for anemia, which can be common if you um, have had heavy periods for a long time. Anemia is having low iron. And if you have low iron, you it really reduces your ability to do physical activity. And as Helen said, that is so very important um, to, for preserving health, reducing risk factors. So that's number one, check for anemia. Number two is to check our thyroid function. The thyroid is a gland in the body that controls the rate we burn calories. And it often slows after the menopause and is seen to slow nine times more often in women than in men. So again, a simple blood test to check the thyroid. We need to review the estrogen levels um, which fall naturally with the menopause. And when the estrogen levels fall, our body fat increases and our muscle mass decreases and muscles burn calories faster. So therefore, as our estrogens reduce, we are in this situation of not of needing dramatically fewer calories to maintain our weight. So again, exercise to promote uh, muscle mass is going to help you burn calories and lose weight. We need also to review our sleep pattern and our alcohol consumption. Estrogen deficiency and low mood will increase insomnia and insomnia will reduce our ability to exercise. My, the fifth factor I always check on is insulin resistance. And finally, and so importantly, is our mental well-being. Menopause often comes at a time where we have so many um, responsibilities and stresses in our life, particularly this year, and this will dramatically reduce our motivation to adopt a healthy lifestyle. So to briefly summarize as to, in the, you know, to try it so that we'll have time for some questions, the essential issues that, that, that I've mentioned need to be addressed and managed, but we're then ultimately down to two challenges. We need after the menopause to maintain a slightly lower and balanced calorie intake. That's usually recommended as 1,200 to 1,500 calories a day. Balanced against maintaining adequate physical exercise. And as Helen said, two and a half hours a week of equivalent to brisk walking is recommended. And I know a lot of people we, we can explore, expand on in this in the question will say to me, well, which, which diet is the best diet? That all diets are associated with um, reducing calories. The importance is to adapt a diet that is both balanced so you don't lose um, inappropriate minerals or vitamins or protein and one that you can maintain. Finally, the um, I just wanted to say the fasting diets that are in vogue at the moment, yes, of course you're going to lose weight and a lot of weight because you're dramatically cutting the number of calories. The long-term benefits are or yet to be confirmed because this is not sustainable. And as soon as you let it go, the weight bounces back. The only diet that doctors tend to be in favor of if you're going to choose a particular diet is the Mediterranean one, which reduces the calories because of the um, food choices, but it also has a reduction in the food choices for um, the cardiovascular risk, that's stroke and heart disease. So I'll just summarize here really um, the talk was, we've had. We've touched on the, the importance of cervical and breast cancer and understanding the, the essential attendance of screens and how often you should go. We've, I've just talked about a summary really, if you like, of healthy lifestyle and the association which runs through all of our talks, of, uh, all three talks of how obesity can cause health problems. And finally, Helen's presentation about the need to tailor the approaches to treating your menopause. And we as GPs, both Helen and I, would welcome always a, a big discussion around this area. So thank you very much for listening.
Thanks, Dr. Ruth, and thanks, Dr. Helen. Um, a really good presentation and really interesting points made. We've had some great questions come through. I'm just going to run through them one by one um, and direct them to, to each of you. Um, the first we've got, which I think is, is for you, um, Dr. Whitby, um, is from one of our attendees. I have a strong family history of bowel cancer in my family. Can I request a stool sample from my GP? So this is a really good question. It's a really important thing to do. Unfortunately, the um, NHS sends out stool kits. There is a cutoff age um, for when you get an invitation and it's usually around 50, that's standard. And NH, in the NHS, we when we work, we can um, arrange that we get a test and do this test for a patient. If that's um, in your situation, I would always do that. And that can be done very simply in the clinic. You wouldn't automatically be on a register to call you for the routine screening that takes place after 50, but you can request this from your NHS GP. Um, of course, if you have a private GP, um, you can, uh, this is much easier and you can, you can have this test. You also, if you've got a strong family history, um, I mean, this is, and I can answer this offline individually for you, but there are other screening tools that we can do just to try and discuss your risk to reduce your risk factors, you know, for instance, smoking, being overweight, and um, just also to reassure you that these stool tests now are very, very much more sophisticated than the uh, old ones that were very good. We now use, a, a, it's called a FIT, which is a fluoroimmuno test, as opposed to looking for little um, traces of blood in the stool. So in answer to your question, yes, I would recommend that you see your GP, um, have a consultation with them and point out the risk factors and your request. Thanks, Ruth. And then another question, and this is for, uh, for Helen, I think. We have an attendee who's 37 and has been told that they are not perimenopausal, um, but they still experience severe night sweats and have done so for about a year. Is there anything else the person can be doing related to it? And should they have any tests done? Thank you for the question. Um, that's a really good question. Um, so definitely night sweats are a symptom. And it's important as doctors, whenever we see any patient with a symptom that we go through the full medical history, uh, find out about um, other symptoms, find out if they're on any medication and if they have anything um, in the family history, are they taking any um, over-the-counter medication, et cetera, et cetera. So just as a summary, night sweats as a symptom can be caused by so many other conditions. It's good that you had your hormone levels checked, and I think that that's very important. Sometimes with hormone levels, we may have to repeat them uh, a few weeks later just to make sure that there's no fluctuation in younger women I'm talking about. But it's also important to exclude other causes of night sweats. And those causes can be certain medication like painkillers or steroids or even antidepressants, um, alcohol or drug use. Um, also anxiety can cause night sweats. There are other conditions like a underact, um, an overactive or an underactive thyroid, um, which is you know, your viral gland, which is responsible for the metabolism in your body. And we can also see it in people sometimes that are anemic. So it is important to have that full MOT of blood just to exclude those causes um, and have that full assessment by your GP. Great question. Thank you. Thanks, Helen. Uh, and then just running on, on to the next couple of questions, I think this is, this is probably more directed at, at Ruth. Um, how regularly should you get your, your breast checked? Uh, and does this change with age? Another good question. Yes and yes. So um, getting your breast checked as we get older becomes more important because as you recall, uh, the risk factors for cancer um, go up um, for breast cancer. And the, there are many times, um, and this is not a one one recommendation fits all. For instance, if you if you if you are worried, you think you found um, a breast lump, and you are under the age of routinely having mammograms, please please come to us and let us do a uh, let us do a, a, a manual exam first, and then send you onwards for checks if that's relevant. Um, 
there are no consistent recommendations. There's nothing written in stone for how often you should have a breast check as opposed to the screening. I personally do a breast check in every single woman, a woman I have the opportunity to do every year if she comes to see me, but also is taking the opportunity opportunistically. So every patient I have, for instance, who's on HRT, before I give a six month prescription, I do a breast check and a blood pressure check. It's just an easy setting. There's no extra work. The patients come in to, to, to perform this test. So you need to look if and take that responsibility. If, for instance, you've, you've had breast cancer in the past, you may find actually worrying at home is this is this not is this not it's actually far better to just come in no doctor would ever mind checking a lady's breast to to reassure them and there as I say there are so many what we call benign breasts lumps and the breast is I'm excusing the term it's quite a lumpy organ and actually checking them yourself properly is, is, is as important as having them checked by a doctor. So again, you can go to your GP and ask them for advice as to how to most accurately assess uh, breast checking. So I would always um, add in breast checks in between um, breast screening opportunistically. And when you go for your Cancer, your cervical cancer smear as a younger woman, if you're concerned, you can ask the nurse or the GP, please, could you just do a, a quick breast check? And um, you can arrange that, uh, you know, before you're onto a, a, a proper screening programme. Thanks, Ruth. And actually, just talking on HRT, I'll direct this towards Helen. Another question um, saying, my HRT consultant says that I'm now on, now I'm on HRT, I'll need to keep taking it for the rest of my life. Um, I have gels. My GP has said um, the opposite and said uh, I should stop it as it's not needed. Who should I believe? Yeah, that's a really, really great question. So as I said in my talk, um, there's not one type that's all. And HRT by far has got more benefits than risks, but it is something that we monitor on women on HRT. We monitor every single year. And we make sure that those benefits are far, will far outweigh the risks. So HRT actually long-term protects women against osteoporosis, heart disease, type two diabetes, osteoarthritis, um, bowel cancer, and even um, Alzheimer's dementia. So as long as those benefits outweigh the risks, women can continue taking HRT in conversation, of course, with a menopausal specialist or um, with a GP who is experienced in menopause, they can continue that um, HRT until um, well into their 70s or 80s and for life, if they want to, and if it continues to give them a good quality of life and the benefits far outweigh the risks. So that annual discussion with the GP um, or with the HRT consultant is quite important to have to reevaluate um, the side effects to reevaluate the benefits, to reevaluate the risks, and they can continue if they prefer to do because it just has such great benefit in um, protecting us from um, osteoporosis and heart disease and other conditions, as I said. So, great question. Thank you. Thanks, Helen. Um, and the final question I'm going to combine this in, into one question um, and direct towards Ruth. Is there any screening women should think about before they get pregnant to improve fertility or pregnancy health? And then similarly, is there any screening women should think about after pregnancy? Um, good question. So formal screening, I would say the, the only formal screening I would do would be to um, uh, make sure your cervical cancer screen is up to date because as you recall on the first few slides, this cervical cancer is fed, if you like, by, by estrogen. So when we're pregnant, these levels are very high. So if you do have cancer of your cervix during pregnancy, you, you, it's very difficult to treat. And I mean, it's, it's not an area we'll go into today, but it, 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 I mean, it's pretty clear in, in many, in, in a lot of instances there. The other things that I would um, recommend some people do is to make sure if they've been feeling very tired, that they've had their iron levels checked pre-pregnancy, pre their thyroid levels checked, 
that they are optimizing their health. So, you know, trying to stop smoking if they're smokers, um, reducing alcohol, and going to your GP to have all these discussions. And the other thing is to take start taking prenatal vitamins, which contain folic acid, before you even get pregnant, because the folic acid is essential for the very, very early stages of the spinal cord and brain development before often a woman knows she's pregnant. So there's no harm in taking it. And of course, people who have the infertility will take it for years and years, desperately waiting to get pregnant. So there's no harm in taking folic acid, which comes over the counter in a prenatal vitamin um, supplement. Post-pregnancy, Again, we like to look at, um, the, make sure the cervical cancer screen is up to date and we should do this if it is due three months after the baby's born. Really, that's about standard. I can't think off the top of my head of any, um, any particular other screening that we would do as associated with um, maximizing a good pregnancy or postnatal. Thanks, Ruth. That's all of our questions today. So I just want to say thank you to Dr. Itakidis for her presentation and Dr. Whitby for her presentation. A really informative session today. Um, thank you also to Southwest Minister Bid hosting Cleveland Clinic. Um, and if you do want any more information, please do visit Cleveland Clinic's website. There is a whole health library um, of information there um, for anyone to explore. Thank you, everyone.